Minnesota filmmaker and United States Army veteran David Crowley was accused of murdering his wife and daughter before taking his own life in December of 2014. The Apple Valley Police Department suspects the bodies were inside the Minnesota home for three weeks after they were found by neighbors on January 17, 2015. Within 24 hours of finding the bodies, authorities assumed this was a double murder-suicide, the culprit was deceased, and the public was not in any danger. Initially, authorities did not see a bullet hole in the living room ceiling or a bullet in the living room carpet. These were two of the most important items in the case, as they were tied to David Crowley and his daughter. It was only after investigators were told of their existence that they returned to the crime scene on two separate occasions and retrieved two spent rounds. What did authorities find in the Crowley house that proved David Crowley murdered his wife and daughter and then killed himself? Without a motive and with the absence of guilt, the case was closed with the status of exceptionally cleared. If David is truly guilty of this crime, then authorities should be forced to prove their theory. The gray stage exists solely because of the official conclusion as stated on page 92 of the Apple Valley Police Reports PDF. With the conclusion of the review of digital devices, Detective Brian Bone reported on October 7, 2015, there is no other information available for further investigation. Throughout this investigation, the AVPD has not discovered any information or evidence that shows anybody but David is the perpetrator of these crimes, including the killing of his wife, child, and himself. blood spatter in the living room was mostly on the ground, according to BCA crime scene team Joe Cooksley. A black Springfield XD-40 handgun, labeled as Item 1A, with a rubber hoe grip sleeve, was found cocked on the living room floor, several inches from David's left hand, according to Detective Tommy Booth. Detective Brian Bone was more specific stating the gun was found approximately one foot to the south of the left side of David's body. According to the firearm worksheet, some apparent blood-like substance was found in the barrel of the gun. The worksheet also mentioned apparent rust-like material, which could have been found on one of three unspent cartridges in the gun. The presence of blood was found on the grip, item 1A-1 slide, item 1A-2, the trigger, item 1A-3, and the muzzle, item 1A-4 of the gun. Item 1B is the magazine inside of the alleged murder weapon. Ridge detail blood found on the magazine was labeled as item 1B-1. Several blood mixtures were found on the gun, specifically on the trigger, item 1A-3 and the magazine, item 1B-1. DNA results show blood of two or more individuals on the trigger, with one of those individuals being David Crowley. The blood did not match Kamel, but Rania could not be excluded as a possible contributor. Two or more DNA profiles were found on the magazine. The major DNA profile on the magazine matched David Crowley. An estimated 99.9997% of the general population was excluded from being possible contributors, but Kamel and Rania could not be excluded. Two cartridges were removed from the magazine and labeled as item 1B1 and item 1B2. Item 1C is an unspent cartridge found in the chamber of the handgun. Latent prints were not found on these three items. Item 1D is listed as a bore patch from item 1, and item 1E is listed as test-fired specimens from item 1. 
Hairs and fibers found on the gun and magazine were labeled as item 1A-5 and item 1B-2. Latent print results revolved around two of three latent prints suitable for comparison, one found on the gun and one found on the magazine. LP1A-1 is a latent palm print on the gun. According to latent print results, no known palm prints for David Crowley were submitted or found in the BCA files for comparison to the palm print on the gun. LP1B-2 is a latent fingerprint found on the magazine. However, this too could not be tied to David Crowley due to the limited quality and quantity of information in latent print. Jennifer Kostrowski consulted with Dennis Randall about this latent fingerprint. He agreed, Kostrowski wrote, it could be one or two prints, plus that LMP was unusual coupled with low quality makes it difficult to determine. The crime scene team found a total of six empty spent cartridges, Detective Bone reported. The crime scene team also found three bullet fragments in the carpet. According to Detective Bone, the BCA crime scene team processed the scene in detail. After the scene was processed, Bone continued, we were able to move the rug that the bodies were found on. These results did not include item 53, which rolled out of a living room carpet on January 20th, nor did they include item 57, which was found in the attic above the living room ceiling. The results of the laboratory firearms determined that item one, which is David's gun, fired items two, three, nine, 30, 36 and 37, which was six Smith & Wesson 40 caliber cartridge cases, and items 42, 43, 44, 45, 53, and 57, which were six bullets. Comparative examinations of item 31, a bullet fragment, against test fired bullets from item 1 and item 57 were performed with the following results. Item 57 against item 31 showed the presence of matching features. This means that item 1 fired 31. Examinations of items 42, 43, 44, 45, 53, 57 showed them to be consistent with bullets from Winchester PXD-1 brand cartridges. Images of a test fired cartridge case from item one were entered into the Minnesota Firearms Database. A search of the database failed to review any items that matched item one. If, for, if future searches of the database reveal a potential match with item one, your agency will be notified and further comparisons can be made. That's from the BCA 485 page document on page 31. So according to the BCA firearms report, item 57 against item 31 show the presence of matching features. This means item 1 fired item 31. And we'll get to more of that when we talk about in our next show, we'll talk about the cartridge casings and the cartridges and the unspent rounds and item 31, which is labeled as a bullet fragment. Based on the firearms report completed May 22, 2015, the gun, item 1A, fired six cartridge casings and six bullets. Item 2 is a cartridge casing found at the corner of the east edge of the carpet near the recliner. Item 3 is a cartridge casing found on the east side of the living room hardwood floor next to a short wooden stool. Item 9 is a cartridge casing found on the south side of the living room carpet. Item 30 is a cartridge casing found on the living room hardwood floor closest to the south wall. 
Item 36 is a cartridge casing found inches from David's left hand on the south end of the living room carpet. Item 37 is a cartridge casing found on the west side of the living room carpet next to the couch. The spent cartridges found on the west side of the living room carpet on January 17, 2015 are labeled as item 42, item 43, and item 44. All three spent cartridges were found close to the living room couch with hair on them. Test results for all three items showed a single source DNA profile matching Kamel while excluding Rania and David as possible contributors. Item 42 weighed 167.96 grams, contained a blood-like and hair-like substance with expanded damage to the nose of the spent cartridge. Item 43 weighed 179.56 grams and also had a blood-like substance but no hair. The nose of the spent cartridge was damaged and partially exposed. A blood-like substance was also observed on item 44. This spent cartridge weighed 130.24 grams with its nose listed as damaged. Item 45 is a spent cartridge found in the south wall of the basement. This spent cartridge weighed 173.90 grams. The nose was listed as damaged and partially expanded. Holes were observed in both the area rug and the wood floor underneath the rug, Joe Cooksley reported. Chemical testing of the hole in the wood floor also failed to detect the presence of lead. This bullet traveled into the living room carpet, pierced through the hardwood floor, leaving behind bullet fragments, and then lodged itself into the south wall of the basement. A section of the drywall around the lodge bullet was cut in order to retrieve item 45. When the styrofoam behind the drywall was removed, a bullet was observed, according to Joe Cooksley. A DNA profile was not found on item 45. Additionally, Joe Cooksley discussed running trajectory tests on the spent cartridge with BCA specialist Chris Olson. He didn't feel it was necessary, Cooksley wrote in his notes. It should be noted here that two spent cartridges labeled as item 53 and 57 were found by accident on two separate occasions days and weeks after the bodies were removed from the house. The others. Item 31 is labeled as a bullet fragment found near the south edge of the living room carpet. Item 7 is the unspent round compressed into the living room carpet. Several thin hairs covered the live round. Strands of hair and pieces of flesh were found close to this bullet. DNA tests were never performed on item 7. According to BCA forensic scientist Rebecca L. Dien, BCA crime scene team Joe Cooksley indicated that analysis is not needed on item 7. Once the processing of the crime scene was completed between January 17th and 18th, investigators left the house with four spent cartridges instead of six. Of the four bullets recovered from the scene, only three had blood on them, only Kamel's blood. Authorities missed two bullets when they left the house on January 18th. Those two bullets will be covered in detail. On January 20th, 2015, Biotech Emergency Services, the company hired to clean the crime scene, was in the process of removing items from the residence when a mushroom bullet, item 53, rolled out of the living room carpet. This spent cartridge has some white material on the surface weighed 169.54 grams and was found with an expanded nose. It should be noted, according to Detective Bone, that the bullet was predominantly flat on the back and was sitting on the front mushroom portion of the bullet. The bullet appeared to be mostly intact at the time of our discovering it. Item 53-1 is a swabbing of item 53. Hairs found on the bullet were labeled as item 53-2. This bullet contained a blood mixture of two or more individuals with the major DNA profile matching Rania. Interestingly, David and Kamel were excluded from being contributors to the newly found bullet. Based on those results, 
authorities should have been looking for a second DNA profile. Unlike some other results, it is not stated that 99% of the general population can be excluded from contributing to the blood mixture of item 53. Since authorities did not discover the spent round on their own, we will never know where item 53 landed after allegedly killing Rania Crowley. What we know for sure is that item 53 rolled out of the living room carpet on January 20th, 2015. What we still need to know is the source of the missing DNA profile or profiles associated with this bullet. Item 57. On February 17, 2015, investigators were notified about a bullet hole in the living room ceiling. Based on that information, authorities returned to the Crowley residence on February 18 and found a bullet, item 57, in the attic above the living room. The bullet weighed 180.18 grams and is the heaviest of all six spent rounds. Like item 45 and item 53, white material was also observed on this spent cartridge. The nose of the bullet was partially expanded. Characteristics of the hole, BCA crime scene lead Joe Cooksley wrote in his report, and its surrounding area indicated that a projectile was traveling generally west to east as it entered the ceiling and exited in the attic. After examining the bullet in the living room ceiling, Authorities found item 57 in the attic above the living room near the front door. There was no blood on this bullet, but the nuclear DNA profile matched David Crowley. The DNA profile did not match Kamel or Rania. An email exchange between BCA analyst Catherine Roach and Detective Tommy Booth stated that no one had been charged with committing a double murder-suicide. Good morning, Catherine, Detective Booth wrote on February 17, 2015, at 8.04 a.m. Nobody has been charged in this case, so I am giving you permission to use up some evidence in its entirety for DNA analysis. If you need anything else, please feel free to contact me. Thanks for all your hard work. Attempting to connect item 57 to the alleged murder weapon, authorities compared the bullet recovered to a bullet fragment found in the living room labeled as item 31. Originally, the bullet fragment labeled item 31 was not included in the firearms examinations. I spoke with Joe Cooksley, BCA analyst Lisa Kinsella wrote on April 14, 2015 at 1014 AM regarding item 31 labeled as bullet fragment or fragments. It isn't included in the FA assignment. We discussed that I will add item 31 to the FA assignment to document it and examine it for suitability comparative exams. The bullet fragment labeled item 31 weighed 19.14 grams. The fragment was noted to have a hair-like substance and a torn jacket. The fragment was compared to items 42, 44, 45, 53, and 57, but not to item 43. According to the BCA firearms report, item 57 against item 31 showed the presence of matching features. This means item 1 fired item 31. I'm not sure how that connects item 57 to the gun, but you can look at the laboratory results here. Since item 57 against item 31 showed the presence of matching features, this means that item 1 fired item 31. According to a report written by Detective Shane Klokonos, a MacBook Pro was located in the kitchen. The device was found to be powered on and active. After the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension had completed processing it for physical evidence, I turned the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth off. There was a text document on the desktop of this device titled Myth that had the words, I have loved you all with all of my heart. 
Later examination of this device showed this text document had last been saved on December 14, 2014 at 4.10 p.m. But an autosave version of this document, the open document, had been last saved on December 25, 2014 at 1.18 p.m. Texting on a different Apple MacBook found that text documents created then saved and open at a later time and had changes made to the document will be autosaved after 60 seconds of inactivity. This computer was kept in its awake state and transported to the ECU by Detective Olson for forensic examination. The laptop labeled as AV-8 was open to a black screen on the kitchen island when authorities entered the house. The device was plugged into a power outlet just above the kitchen sink, and the screen was black. Love was written on the laptop cover. Blood and partial fingerprints were visible on the laptop surface and keyboard. Several blood stains were visible on the kitchen island counter next to the laptop. When the laptop was swabbed for DNA purposes, the black screen awoke to reveal a text message reading, I have loved you all with all of my heart. I was not certain if this note was saved or otherwise date or time stamped, Detective Brian Bone reported. The note was not signed and was in the format of a typed note. Authorities assumed the message was written by David Crowley, but that assumption remains unproven. Three areas of Bloody Ridge detail were identified on the laptop and labeled as A, B, and C. Of the three areas, only area A was sufficient for latent print analysis. Item 54 is a CD of 25 NEF images of latent prints found on the laptop. A digital latent palm print of Area A was then labeled as LP54-1. LP54-1 was searched in the Midwest Automated Fingerprint Identification Network database, and no suitable candidate was generated. Additionally, no known palm prints for David Timothy Crowley were submitted or found in the BCA files for comparison to LP54-1. Item 23 is blood swabbed on the surface of the laptop. DNA results tie the blood to Kamel while excluding David and Rania. According to Joe Cooksley, the Item 23 bloodstain was in close proximity to apparent bloody ridge detail. A chemical was used to enhance the ridge detail. The ridge detail was documented with photographs prior to and after the application of the enhancement chemical. Blood found on the A key of the laptop was swabbed and labeled as item 24. Though collected and itemized, the blood on the A key was not submitted for DNA testing. The blood wall. BCA crime scene team lead Joe Cooksley noted no latent prints observed on writing in blood on West living room wall. Item 11 is a swab of the blood writing on the living room wall. Specifically, this item is the second A in Alau. The blood pointed to a single source matching Kamel while excluding David and Rania. The writing appeared to be in blood, Detective Brian Bone wrote in his report, and written with somebody's hand and fingers, as you can see individual finger marks in the writing. Similarly, the B in Akbar was swabbed and labeled as item 12. However, item 12 was not tested for a DNA source, which is interesting since Joe Cooksley requested DNA analysis on both items 11 and 12. Item 40 is the pin found next to the notepad on the computer desk. Blood found on the grip of the pin was labeled as item 40-1. The pin was not one of the items submitted for nuclear DNA testing. The pin was not one of three latent prints suitable for comparison to David Crowley. So how do we know David used the pin to write on the notepad nearby? 
Item 41 is the notepad found on the computer desk in the office bedroom. Authorities found the notepad flipped open to page 30 of 59. On page 30 were two strange, unexplained sentences. The first was, open the rise most recent version. The second message was, submit to Allah now. Neither of these two messages were ever labeled as suicide notes by authorities. More importantly, who can prove David wrote the two messages? Bloody visual ridge detail was found on the following pages. 41A-30, back. 41A-31, front and back. 41A-31-30. 41A-31-1. 41A-31-2. 41A-32, front, 41A-33, front, 41A-34, front, possible RD, 41A-58, back. Items 41A-35, 41A-36, and 41A-37 had minimal apparent blood on the bottom edges. BCA analyst Jennifer Kostrowski's notes dated July 14, 2015 state she spoke with Joe Cooksley about which items should be processed for latent prints. Kostrowski was told it was sufficient to only process pages with RD in apparent blood. Other pages returned to item packaging, no LP processing on item 41. Results of the alternate light source examination were conclusive. Examinations of the front and back cover of the notebook, item 41, and the 59 pages that were originally within the notebook, items 41A-1 through 41A-59, failed to reveal any latent writing material. Item 41-1 is blood found on the front cover of the notepad. This could mean the notepad was closed before two messages on page 30 were written. The item was never tested. Item 41-2 is blood found on page 30 of the notepad. Two sentences were written on that page. Open the rise most recent version and submit to Allah now. The blood on this page contained a mixture of two or more individuals, with the major DNA profile matching Kamel. David and Rania were excluded from being possible contributors to the blood tested on page 30. So who is the source of the other DNA profile or profiles? Regarding the latent print examinations, item 41A-30 is page 30 of the notepad. LP 41A-30-1 is a latent impression, finger slash palm, observed on page 30. Latent print results were inconclusive to Crowley due to the limited quality and quantity of information in the latent and known prints. Similarly, item 41A-31 is page 31 of 59. LP 41A-31-1 is a latent fingerprint on page 31, which was identified as David's left middle finger. This is the only conclusive connection between David and the notepad. Separately, two SDA lifts taken of impressions found on the front side of page 20 of the spiral notepad were examined and labeled as item 41A-20A. Item 41A-21A consisted of two ESDA lifts taken of impressions found on the front side of page 21 of the spiral notepad. Can we safely assume pages 20 and 21 were the only notepad pages with indented impressions? Handwriting comparisons between what was written on the notepad and the writings on the refrigerator door and checkbook in the kitchen never happened. Three pages, labeled as 41A-39, 41A-40, and 41A-41, were warped from being wet from something. These are the three writings found inside of the Crowley home on January 17, 2015. The Recliner 
What happened at this recliner? The blood on the recliner item 34 wasn't examined, even though there was a huge blood stain on the bottom left corner. Considering the huge circular stain in the image, I was surprised authorities decided not to swab the item. Hair and small blood stains were also present on the upper right portion of the recliner, but not mentioned in reports. The blood on the recliner does not line up with where the three bodies were found. BCA 4984 shows this recliner in its reclined state. This is one of the largest blood stains in the living room and at the crime scene. How did this blood get there? Whose blood is associated with it and why? And why was it never tested? This blood stain shows somebody's body was moved at some point, but by who? The gunshots. Of the 12 neighbors that were interviewed about the Crowley family, only two neighbors reported hearing gunshots, Colin Procknow and Alan Olson. Colin lived one house left of the Crowleys. Alan Olson lived behind the Crowley family on Lowell Drive. According to police reports, Colin Procknow reportedly heard gunshots between December 2nd and December 19th, 2014. Mr. Procknow was able to narrow down the date to December 9th or December 10th, sometime between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. most likely. Mr. Procknow also believed the gunshots came from the direction of the Crowley residence. Colin did not contact law enforcement, Officer Tara Becker reported, but stated that he checked out his front door and didn't see anything and checked out the back of his residence and thought it was fireworks. The second neighbor who heard gunshots was Alan Olson, who lived on the street behind David Crowley. Detective Brian Bone first spoke with Alan's wife, Gina Olson, who mentioned her husband heard, quote, three rapid-fire shots from somewhere outside their residence. A day later, Detective Bone followed up with Alan Olson to learn more about the gunshots heard before December 31st, 2014. Mr. Olson stated he was sitting in his living room one evening with his daughter when he heard three rapid-fire gunshots somewhere outside of his house. Olson could not remember exactly where the sounds came from, but he was certain he heard gunshots. Olson told Detective Bone that he and his family were home between 1 p.m. on Christmas Eve and 1 p.m. on Christmas Day. However, Mr. Olson was unsure if he heard the gunshots on either of those days. Detective Bone's report ended by stating, Alan explained that he had not called the police because he did not have any specific information about when he heard the shots. How many gunshots should have been heard? 6. If the fragment, item 37, belonged to one of the four spent rounds found on January 17, 2015. Yet there was a maximum of three possible shots heard sometime between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Three rapid-fire shots, not six. Three shots could have accounted for what's in Kamel and Rania's autopsies. The reports state Kamel was shot twice and Rania was shot once. But that doesn't line up with the DNA results which show there were three bullets tied to Kamel, and another bullet was tied to Rania and an unknown DNA profile. If the three bullets tied to the three rapid-fire shots were truly tied to the deaths of Kamel and Rania, that still leaves three bullets fired after their deaths. Only one of those bullets would account for David's death. Another bullet was fired into the floor of the living room landing in the south basement wall. But that still leaves a bullet found close to Kamel, which only has her DNA blood on it. How could this bullet only have Kamel's blood, considering where the bodies were found? Let's take a look at the simple truth here. 
Kamel was shot at least twice, ruling out a suicide on her part. If Kamel died last, which is something we will consider in a future episode, there is no way she could have killed herself. The autopsy state Kamel was shot twice, but DNA results have her blood and only her blood on three bullets. Rania was found on top of Kamel's back leg. If Rania was shot where they say she was, it's possible some of that blood should have been on one of those three bullets tied to Kamel. Yet the bullet tied to Rania completely rules out Kamel and David as contributors, but does include an unknown DNA source. So the bullet tied to Rania did not just have Rania's DNA on it. Another simple truth is that neighbors did not hear six fired shots in the area. Of the 12 neighbors who were interviewed by the police, only two of them reported hearing any type of shots or fireworks between December 2nd and December 31st, 2014. What Colin Proc now heard on December 9th or December 10th is not relevant to the deaths of David Kamel and Rania Crowley for the simple fact that David Kamel and Rania Crowley were still alive on December 9th and December 10th. That still leaves Alan Olson. He was certain he heard three rapid fire gunshots between December 24th and New Year's Eve. Rapid fire, three shots. That leaves three gunshots he did not hear. But if those three rapid fire shots came from the same gun, what targets did they hit? And does that line up with DNA results? Perhaps. But only if someone's body was moved at some point, then placed later where the first responders found them. In the end, no one heard six shots. They should have. But that doesn't mean that there were not shots fired in the house between late December of 2014 and mid-January of 2015. The order of deaths and the body placement will be covered soon. What do we know about David Crowley? David Crowley was accused of a double murder suicide. He was accused of murdering his wife, his daughter, and then committing suicide. The bodies of David, Kamel, and Rania Crowley were found on January 17, 2015. Within 24 hours, David Crowley was being accused of a double murder suicide. Those accusations are baseless. They were baseless then, and they are baseless now. What do we know about David Crowley? What do we know about Kamel Crowley? Kamel and her sister were born on a United States military base in Saudi Arabia. Once her father left his position with the U.S. military, Detective Jim Gummert reported, they returned to live in Pakistan where her mother and father were originally born. The Alam family stayed in Pakistan until Kamel was 17 years old and then moved to Texas. Kamel then met David while attending Baylor University, a private Christian university in Waco, Texas. David grew up in Owatonna, Minnesota. David and Mitch Heil became best friends in 2000 while attending Owatonna High School. In 2004, David and Mitch joined the United States Army together on June 22. David's place of entry into active duty is listed as Fort Snelling in Minnesota. 
According to Mitch Heil, both he and David were sent to Fort Banning in Georgia for Army basic training. After completing basic combat training, David was sent to Germany. David Crowley served in the United States Army for a total of five years, two months, and 22 days, beginning on January 22, 2004 and ending on September 13, 2009. Three years, three months, and 15 days of service were listed under the Foreign Service section of his Release from Active Duty Form, DD Form 214. David's home of record at the time of entry into service was his dad's home in Owatonna, and he was released from service at Fort Hood Army Base in Texas. According to Mitch Ohio, Detective Tommy Booth reported, David was first deployed to Iraq. David was in Iraq from November 2, 2005 to November 11, 2006. While deployed in Iraq, Detective Booth continued, David had gone through a traumatic incident where an IED had blown up the Humvee that he was in. When the IED had blown up the Humvee, David had to save one of his teammates and lost several members of his team while over in Iraq. Islam is a religion of peace, David wrote in a Facebook group on February 7, 2007. But where's the peace in trying to kill anyone who isn't a Muslim? They are not about love, they're about victory. Is Allah insisting that a good Muslim should murder people who are different? They have been brought up in a place where sectarian violence is simply a way of life and blindly follow their leaders into a violent religious frenzy. They fight for a God that is not behind what they do. But even more so, they fight for key political leaders who use the masses for their own ends, just as you guys are saying our government is doing to us. But if these statements are true, at least ours is geared towards peace and charity, not violence without end. David has been to at least 11 countries. Dude, I've killed people in service of my homeland, David wrote during a Facebook group discussion on February 6, 2007, and have been to more countries than you have fingers. As a soldier on the ground, David wrote in the group discussion on February 3, 2007, I have seen enormous resources put into the betterment of the general Iraq populace be it school installations or medical functions or whatever. After David's tour in Iraq, he was sent to Texas, where he hoped to wait out his term of service and leave the army. That's when David met Kamel. Six weeks after they met, David and Kamel were married. The paperwork was filed on May 14, 2008, and the marriage was official eight days later on May 22, 2008. Instead of being allowed to leave the army, David was stop-lost in voluntary extension of service and shipped off to Afghanistan from June 26, 2008 to June 11, 2009. According to David's records, he was retained in service 449 days for the convenience of the government per 10 U.S.C. 12305. Kamel lived with her parents while David was in Afghanistan. Kamel graduated from Baylor University with a degree of Bachelor of Science in Family and Consumer Sciences on May 15, 2009. Two months after David was released from active service, Rania Crowley was born. The daughter of David and Kamel came into the world at 6.38 p.m. on August 6, 2009. Rania weighed 5 pounds, 11 ounces, measuring 8 centimeters in length. David Kamel and Rania Crowley moved to Minnesota shortly after David left the military. David Crowley and Mitch Heil then enrolled in the Minnesota School of Business together in 2009. The two men also started two businesses in 2009, Hothead Productions and Bullet Exchange. My work with Hothead Productions, David wrote on his LinkedIn profile, included writer, director, post-production supervisor, composer, branding, marketing, client relations, 
pre-production, storyboard artists, visual effects artists, logo design animation, title animation, social media campaign manager, location shoots, camera operation, family headshot model event photographer, and website designer content manager. We also tackled professional photography, doing events, family headshot production, and model and fashion. Lots of graphic artwork in this arena as well. David also explained the origins of Bullet Exchange. My partner Mitch Heil and I began Bullet Exchange to service the Minneapolis film community's potential for realistically dressed and equipped military components in film. We provided authentic props and costuming services, as well as serving as prop master, armorer, range cadre, stunt choreographer, actor trainer, and military consultant for concept and script. I also was in charge of the company's marketing, client relations, and media and branding. The Bullet Exchange remains the only resource in the Midwest for authentic police and military equipment rentals specifically tailored for film and theater. David volunteered at the Progeria Research Foundation as a language translator from October of 2009 until May of 2010. David assisted with translations of Western research documents to Urdu script for clinical use in Karachi. Kamel Crowley purchased a Springfield XD-40 caliber handgun, serial number US-163310, on July 25, 2009. The purchase was made via check in the amount of $508.76 at the Gun Zone in Dallas, Texas. The same gun was later sold by David Crowley on June 17, 2012 to someone named David Stark. On November 8, 2009, David and Kamel completed the Permit to Carry a Handgun course with Eric D. Packizer. Mr. Packizer is a certified firearms instructor for Quorum Security, Inc. in Minnesota. Mr. Packiser was also featured in David Crowley's documentary, Gray State, The Rise. Officer Tara Becker recorded audio statements from both Colin and Judy Procknow. According to one of Officer Becker's supplemental reports, Colin looked through the front window and observed what he thought to be dummies. Colin stated that he now knows that they were bodies of the deceased, but initially he thought that they were dummies or some type of props that were left in the residence to appear as though they were home when they weren't. Mr. Proc now then returned home and explained what he saw to his wife. Colin saw what he wanted to be mannequins, Judy Proc now told me on March 24, 2017. And the reason he said mannequins is because of the condition the bodies were in, without heads and things like that. You just don't expect to see headless bodies anyway. Judy also explained to me what she saw when she looked through the front window. I saw David lying on the floor, away from Kamel and Ron and the baby. I thought it was a mannequin at first too, and then I realized it wasn't. I couldn't figure out what was wrong until I noticed that there was a spine with a small piece of skull attached. I looked by the couch, Judy continued, and I saw a big bundle of things. I thought at first it was a big butt, and then I saw a little hand. Then I realized that they were all dead, and it was our neighbors. Judy was certain the three bodies were David, Kamel, and Rania before she contacted authorities. Mrs. Procknell then went home and dialed 911. It just looks like there's a pile of bodies, Judy explained to the dispatcher, and one like the head is eaten off. I suppose by the dog, Judy continued, and I just, my husband thought they were dummies, but they, the hands look real, and they would have been there be, since before Christmas. Colin Proc now then called 911 and asked if police could do a welfare check at 1051 Ramsdale Drive. I looked through the front window, Colin relayed to the dispatcher, and there's like three dummies on the floor. I don't think there are any bodies, but I don't, it just looks like there's a gun next to one. A handgun? I saw one body that was probably, oh, maybe six to eight feet away from the window, 
and then I noticed that there was another body maybe six to seven feet away from the first one. And I noticed that there was a little body that looked like it was almost in the second body's arms. At 1.04 p.m. on January 17, 2015, Apple Valley Police Sergeant Greg Dahlstrom arrived at the crime scene. There he saw Colin Procknow standing in Loray Tuppy's driveway. Mr. Procknow approached the officer, stating there were three bodies in the living room of the Crowley home. Sergeant Dahlstrom then approached the front window and looked inside the residence. I noticed several obviously dead bodies lying on the floor near the front picture window, Sergeant Dahlstrom wrote in his supplemental report. I noticed a black handgun on the floor as well. Lastly, I noticed a medium-sized dog barking and running among the bodies. I advised dispatch of my findings, Sergeant Dahlstrom continued, and requested the channel be restricted to emergency traffic. Officer Tara Becker was the second responder to arrive at the crime scene. Sergeant Dahlstrom advised me that there were in fact three deceased parties that could be seen from the large picture window at the front of the residence. Officer Becker did not report seeing the bodies in any of her supplemental reports we received. Officer John Broughton arrived third. While all three officers were standing on the west side of the house, they could smell the odor of decaying bodies. Officer Broughton was the first officer to check the back of the house. I was instructed to check the rear of the residence for any signs of forced entry, Broughton documented. The backyard is fenced in with a chain link fence and the gates were closed but not locked. Officer Broughton entered the backyard and saw fresh animal tracks in the snow. Signs of forced entry were not found on any backyard windows, but there was an open door. The rear sliding patio door was found open slightly one fourth inch, wrote Broughton. I opened the door and found that it was not locked or secured with the bar lock. Paleo continued to bark as Broughton opened the rear slider. When I opened the patio door, there was an overpowering odor of decaying flesh. One light was on in the dining room, Broughton continued. The Christmas tree lights and other strings of Christmas tree lights were still on. After walking around the back of the house, Officer Broughton looked through the front window and saw three bodies on the living room floor. They were all badly decomposed, Broughton wrote in his report. One adult body was laying on its back with a black semi-auto pistol nearby. The second adult body appeared to be laying on its stomach and or side. Between two adult bodies was the body of a small child. In 2012, David graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Digital Video and Media Production. After two years in the making, the Grey State movie trailer was released to the public on August 7, 2012. A month after its release, David Crowley was interviewed by the Freedom Fiends talk radio show. The interview conducted by Michael W. Dean came out on September 15, 2012. The Grey State movie trailer cost David Crowley and Mitch Heil $6,000 to make. That's just out of pocket through our production company, David explained to Michael Dean. That's just money spent harnessing the actors to our set and getting the props that we needed, but we spent another year in post-production, doing 17-hour days. So how do you put a price tag on that, really? The story of Grey State continually evolved. It's gotten deeper. David said of the Grey State story. It's gotten very much darker. So people, when they see this, their response is, as I knew they would be, they're very divided. First of all, they're very supportive, like, wow, this is like a future scenario that we can face. 
that we are facing right now unless we wake up. Then what they want to do is they want to assign their responsibility for activism to my project and assume that that's what I want to do is wake people up with gray state when in fact I can't make any such moral distinction because I'm a filmmaker. I'm an artist. What I'm going to do is explore human truths and I can do so through a pretty messed up context like the gray state world. But how real or not real it is, is completely irrelevant. What I'm saying is, David clarified to the host, people kind of expect me to tell their story, their version of truth with gray state, and that's not my intent. If it resonates with truth with you, that is great. If it doesn't, that's also great. But what I've been seeing is that the 3% or so who really hate Grey State, they don't hate it because it was shot poorly. Or that story could never work and here's why. They hate it because it threatens them. It threatens their reality. And that just tells me that what I'm doing is close to the truth at least. Because they're that threatened by it. I think that the reality that most people live in is almost like a religion. Like if you challenge a Christian or a Muslim who just grew up believing what they believe, they don't know how to defend it logically. What they're going to do is they're going to lash out in a very knee-jerk and negative response to defend their reality. And that's just the nature of humanity, I think. So what I'm seeing is their reaction to gray state is either very positive or very negative. It is a very polarized argument. David made it clear he was not interested in selling the Grey State project unless it was for serious money. If a studio bought this project, David said to the host, it would just get put on a shelf or be drastically changed from its original message. So in the interest of maintaining creative control, I will not sell the project. However, if it goes nowhere, and someone's offering me $200 million or something awesome like that, you know, who knows? I gotta feed the monkey. But as it stands right now, I want to get this film funded. And I will get it made for whatever budget I can get. If that means 500000 great. If that means $25 million, like it needs, then that's great too. But this movie will get made, even if it's a long-term haul. When Michael W. Dean asked if the eventual movie would have a happy ending, David responded by asking the host a question. What do you think? You tell me. I would guess and hope that it probably has a triumphant ending, Dean answered. But it's the hero standing on a pile of bodies, some of them people he knew. That's pretty close, David admitted. That's pretty astute. I'm proud of you. There will be a pile of bodies. You won't know who's going to end up in that pile when you're watching it. A film has to follow convention. A film has to follow convention. It has to follow that storytelling formula. Otherwise, the story doesn't work. But once you know the rules, you can break the rules. And Grey State breaks the rules in that it's not only immediately physical, it's interdimensional. It's very layered. It's spiritual at times, without adhering to any sort of Western philosophy. But it's deep. It's taken me a long time to craft this story, and while it might not be a physically surface level happy ending, anyone who's paying attention will extract some real values from the ending. The Grey State trailer did not put David Crowley in debt. It's all paid for. We paid cash for everything. If Grey State takes off and starts to pay the bills, that'll be sweet. Otherwise, it would have to take a back burner while we make a living. David also explained the filming process for the movie trailer. We wanted to do it for real, but a lot of it was guerrilla, unfortunately. A lot of the scenes we did, it was like it had the real scale of a real production, so a lot of them, yes, we went to the city, we got permits, we hired cops to babysit for us for a few hours, and we did it for real. But a lot of the stuff was just guerrilla, just because we couldn't get a hold of the city liaison who does that stuff or they didn't know what to do. It was only a three second shot anyways. So there's a couple things like that, but for, by and large, it was a real production. Minneapolis is a bitch to deal with, David continued. They want to charge you like $150 an hour. 
even if you're just a freelance photographer. The initial park scene we shot in guerrilla style, just real quick. But the St. Paul people, I mean Twin Cities is Minneapolis and St. Paul, those guys are a delight to deal with. They'll give you a cop, they'll make all the communications for you, and they'll set it up for you. And all you got to do is send them a check at the end of the day. During the interview, David Crowley was asked if he had made any enemies as a result of the Gray State Project. I do know that I've already made a lot of enemies, Crowley responded, and that this was a long time ago, actually. I made enemies just by releasing little bits and talking to people about my idea for this film, long before it was even released as a trailer. And I have made no shit enemies just because they don't want to hear it, and a lot of them have been family. Not my family, but I'm talking about other actors who've spoken to their family about it and people who don't want to hear it. And what they do is they assign like, well, that can't be real, so it's going to be a terrible movie, so I don't want to hear anything about it. But I wonder if they thought the same thing about Toy Story. Like, hey, toys don't talk. This movie sucks. So the negative reaction has largely been not reputable. So it's just been a lot of silly banter about, you know, I'm a Zionist pig and don't support my film. Michael Dean also asked if Crowley had ever been contacted by a government agency. If I were contacted by a government agency, David responded, I would not know about it. So I can't really answer that question. I'm sure that I have been. A lot of the reactions I'm getting about the trailer, they want to peg me as some kind of Zionist Jew, I guess, because my name is David. I guess that's proof enough for them. My lead actor's name is Danny Mason. Oh, you mean like Freemasons? You know, so they want to develop their own conspiracy theories. They want to say the whole film is COINTELPRO. I'm just trying to develop lists to put them on. It's all very, very silly. David also mentioned being accused of being a Marxist. Asked if he's a Christian, David responded, I am. I am, but I don't know where to draw that line between what I've been taught my whole life and what is probably more closer to the truth, if that makes sense. I've done a lot of spiritual exploration. I tend to end at the same answers, though. David also addressed the critics and negative responses to his project. A lot of people say that Gray State is just fear porn and they're not going to support it, and it's fear-mongering and stuff like that. Just because Gray State is scary, doesn't make it fear porn. Even though you may be killed resisting, the act of resistance on a metaphysical level has value. David Crowley, 2012. The Quran. A Quran was found on the living room floor, open to page 995. Of the several torn Quran pages found on the living room floor, only three pages with blood stains were labeled and submitted to the laboratory. These are labeled as item 5, item 6, and item 10. Two of these pages, item 5 and item 6, were found next to David. Item 6 was found under brown fabric. The other page, item 10, was found on the opposite side end of the living room floor next to Kamel. Looking at the BCA lab results, the Quran and the three pages were not tested and not mentioned further. In fact, the Quran was barely mentioned in the Apple Valley police reports. Initially, aside from one image of the living room wall, all mention of the blood writing, the Quran, and the note in the office bedroom were redacted from police reports. Even when the Quran was mentioned in BCA documents, it was simply referred to as a book. This is the Quran found on the living room floor. Item 8 is a camouflage knife found in the open position with blood stains on the blade and hole of the blade. The knife was close to David's left leg next to the couch 
The DNA on the knife came from a mixture of two or more individuals according to DNA results. David, Kamel, and Rania cannot be excluded from being possible contributors to the mixture, but 99.9998% of the general population could be excluded. Item 8-1 is blood swabbed inside the hole of the blade. Item 8-2 is a swab of blood found on the folding side of the blade. Blood is not present on the handle of the knife, item 8-3. Item 8-4 is a hair sample found on the handle. Since a knife was found in the open position, is this evidence of a struggle? This is the knife found on the living room floor. everyone this is Sophia from the Gray Stage podcast and I'd like to invite all of our listeners to join the Justice for David Crowley and family group located on Facebook where we have almost 4,000 members in this group we welcome discussions regarding the case and have all of the documents located in the file section for everyone to review if you like, you're welcome to visit Greg Fernandez Jr.'s website called The Gray Stage. It's located at thegraystagewordpress.com. You can find his book and all the official documents for this case at his website. Lastly, I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Michelle, who's a part of this podcast. Catherine Michelle has a YouTube channel under her name where she mainly discusses the Crowley case. So please feel free to stop by and give her channel a like and a listen. Until our next podcast, keep seeking the truth and justice for David Crowley and his family.